All right. So today I want to start off by just um, quoting a few things, a few things I was reading about. Well, well, I'll just, I'll just start reading them. Um, in 2017, there was an article and it said this, experts are evenly split on whether the coming decade will see a reduction in false and misleading narratives online. Those forecasting improvement place their hopes in technological fixes and in societal solutions. Others think the dark side of human nature is aided more than stifled by technology. So basically what it's saying is um, there's, there's, um, they're saying that people are evenly split on whether they think that the kind of the uh, false narratives that go around, um, particularly on the internet, half say it's going to get better and, you know, technology is going to fix it. And then half say that it's just going to get worse because, um, you know, human nature is human nature. And I was thinking for this talk, just how amazing it is that, you know, if, if you would think in medieval times that, if you could foresee the future that we'd all be able to talk to each other, the whole world would be able to look at, know what everyone's saying, what the news is, the single, single message, the news and all that sort of stuff. And that we would be so far in a worse situation in terms of knowing what the truth is. Uh, it would be kind of mind blowing. So I think three years, just three years after this 2017 article, I think we have our answer as to whether, <laughs> In, ten, in seven years, it's going to be better. Um, <clears throat> but I think more importantly than that is, it seems to me that there's a general lack of care about um, that the truth would be uh, important. And I'm generalizing here, so obviously there are genuine people around. But um, in general, I, don't, I just think people are pushing their their view and really it's no longer that big deal if, if what they're saying is highly accurate or sort of accurate or just an ends to justify the means. And, um, I think, uh, there's a, there's a term confirmation bias and, uh, that's the, that's mostly what's happening these days is people are just, um, spreading their, their narrative on, on what they think <clears throat> in 2016, the Oxford dictionary selected the following word as word of the year. The word was post-truth. So the word was post-truth, word of the year. And they defined it as relating to or denoting circumstances in which objective facts are less influential in shaping public opinion than the appeal to emotion, emotion and personal belief. Um, so another sort of sign of those things. And, and again, I think, you know, I think back to 2016, 2017, it feels like light years ago from where we are now. Um, and the third little nugget fact here is that how much, um, this kind of misinformation and falsehoods can actually have an impact now that we're all connected. And now that finance is all connected and all that, um, there was a, a fake story that came out in 2017 that a founder of a, a very important um, company had died in a car crash and the market value of that company dropped $4 billion. And of course the story wasn't true at all. And um, you know, for, for $4 billion to be lost, I'm sure some of it was gained back, but for that kind of thing to happen is, you know, things are very volatile in, in today's society. Um, turn to John chapter 18, John chapter 18. So <clears throat> today I want to talk about the relationship between truth and several other things. So the, the relationship between truth and, and trust and courage and fear and, uh, several different things, but in uh, John chapter 18. 
Hang on a second. All right. Verse 33, John 18. Then Pilate uh, entered. Oh, let me check if you guys have got it. Not yet. Okay. The ads are overcoming. Overcoming the scriptures. We are sponsored today by 30 day gratitude calendars. Okay. Verse 33. <clears throat> All right. It says, then Pilate entered the praetorium again, called, called Jesus and said to him, are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered him, are you speaking for yourself about this or did others tell you this concerning me? Pilate answered, am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you to me. What have you done? Verse 36, Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight so that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from here. Pilate therefore said to him, are you a king then? Jesus answered, you, are, you say rightly that I am a king. For this cause I was born, and for this cause I have come into the world, that I should bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. Verse 38, Pilate said to him, what is truth? And when he had said this, he dropped the mic and walked out of the room. So um, I th I think this is really amazing, this verse, because... Um, sort of the absence of a key word here changes the focus of this what is truth line and the key word is the definite article the word the because if he had have said what is the truth that's a little bit different of a question but he said what is truth which expands the focus of the question it expands the meaning of the of the question to be a little larger perhaps than the fairly already large topics they were discussing. And it starts to ask, what value does the truth have? And how do you find out the truth? And how do you settle on it? And, um, you know, is it possible to agree on it? There's all these things and just that three word question that come out of it. And probably no more important verse than in today's world, what is truth? And so that's what we're going to look a little bit about today. And um, we'll turn back a few chapters to John chapter 14. John chapter 14. And um, I wanted to talk about the relationship between truth and courage. And um, it's sort of an odd, odd relationship these days, truth and courage, because... Um, it still takes a lot of courage to tell the truth, particularly the spiritual truth. Um, and particularly even, um, secular ideas that would hold society to some kind of moral fiber. Those are still hard to, to tell, but then there's also, um, there's also, uh, an aspect of, um, <clears throat> The fact that to, to spread mass untruths or mass confusion takes very little courage, despite the fact that you're having a massive impact, you'd think it would be the opposite. If you, um, if you were going to spread something that wasn't true, that it might prick the heart and maybe, uh, make you think, but in today's, today's society, uh, people don't think twice. And, um, of course, there is an aspect to this, and, and particularly in the kind of pseudo-Christian world, that uh, it's not very controversial to say whatever the masses already think and to maybe uh, change it 5% and, 
um, no one will bat an eyelid. Um, and so despite these different kind of mass untruths that can be spread, whether it's um, things that aren't true about the Bible or things that aren't true about just facts in society, um, the courage that it takes to spread a message is not related to how true it is. Um, it's actually tied to the audience you're speaking to. So if I, if I preach the gospel right now, um, doesn't take much courage because I think that all of us on here are believing the same thing. But if I go out and into the world and, and say that, um, the gospel that's in the Bible, uh, it takes more courage because of the context in which I'm speaking it. Um, and in verse, sorry, in uh, chapter 14 of John and verse 16, it says, um, or f verse 15, if you love me, keep my commandments and I will pray the father and he will give you another helper that he may abide with you forever. Uh, the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him for he dwells with you and will be in you. Um, and so the Bible reflects that, um, that the, the world is not going to accept the truth. And, um, and so we are not surprised when that happens. Um, the inverse of, of truth and courage is truth and fear. And, uh, and sometimes in society and, and things that go on, the, the people that are telling the truth are the most fearful. And as I said before, the people that aren't telling the truth don't have any fear because um, there's no fear in when the masses believe the wrong thing. Um, and it's sort of like, uh, there's Newton's laws of thermodynamics and I don't remember which one it is, but you know, there's ones that, uh, that talk about that order will tend towards disorder or chaos. Like if you let, um, if you light a match in a room and there's smoke coming off that match, that, um, smoke isn't going to just sort of keep its shape that smoke is going to dissipate throughout the room. And it's sort of like in, in our world um, that any mass, any message that goes um, to the masses sort of tends to be um, less precise, more vague, more bland, more, um, more widely accepted and watered down. And, um, that's just, that's just the way it is in our world. And so, and that's why I guess you could think of it even, you know, <clears throat> the, the word says that a remnant is going to be saved. And, you know, it's not just saying that all the spirit filled people are a remnant, but it's saying of all the spirit filled people, there's going to be a remnant saved as well. And so um, we all have to, to, to be aware of that and realize that just because we're spirit filled doesn't mean we're, we're going to make it. Um, we need to, to keep very sharp. And I think, um, you know, there's been over the years, um, churches break up because they have a different opinion on a key thing and people leave. And so over time, you know, there's just this fragmenting of, of the Lord's church and, and this breaking down and there's still that, that core there, the Lord's people, his kingdom. And there's still that core people who follow the truth, but around them, it's just like this crumbling, crumbling away. And we have to keep building up uh, the Lord's church so that there is that core that keeps sustaining itself. Um, there's a, there's a saying, and I mentioned it before that the ends justify the means and so a lot of um lies and untruth comes from the fact that people believe that their that their goal or their their end goal is true and honest and needs to be implemented no matter what 
and it needs to be sort of enforced no matter what. And so there's one particular belief that says to get there, um, anything's allowed. You know, you can do anything as long as your end goal is some kind of pure target, uh, you can do anything. And this belief opens the door to many, many problems. And it, it opens the door to justification, self-justification, um, obviously, um, you know, the, the, the word of the Lord goes out the window because you've said, well, I'm, I'll be there in the end. I'll be in that uh, pure spot in the end, but on the way there, I might take some interesting paths to get there. Now, just a, a random example. Um, and I don't remember the partic particular details of this, but, um, in, uh, I think it was in Perth, there was a, uh, some kind of church and they put on, on plays and meetings and that, those kinds of things. And I think it was from memory, it was a, as a play and, um, and when they'd, they'd have new people along to the, the play kind of as an outreach and, and, uh, the people started finding out that the policy was to lock the doors of the church once the play had started. And so I think this church thought that, well, we got to get this message to these people and uh, they're not going to actually be able to leave during this event. And so the doors are locked and it's just a silly example of, you know, how I guess we can also have the same danger. Um, the Lord will, will find his sheep. We don't have to be locking doors and we don't have to be um, physically, um, preventing people from, from departing from the, from the true message. That's fine. We'll find, uh, we'll move on to the next person that sort of wipe the dust off our feet. Um, so that's not how we, we do it. Next point is the, uh, the relationship between truth and history. And I just wanted to, uh, divert onto, cause it, this kind of thought of, um, how history is interpreted and history is generally thought of as sort of this, a factual set in, set in stone thing, um, that we can at least, you know, we can rely on history to be truthful, but, um, even that not so much actually, um, in the last few months, uh, my neighbor has written a couple of letters to the local uh, newspaper about uh, some of the, and I, I don't know what's true and what's not, but um, as far as the, the civil war and the reasons for it and um, what Abraham Lincoln stood for and all that. And so even in the, the newspaper, it's just this, just completely um, opposed views of history on what you, even a couple of hundred years ago, you'd think we could all agree on it. So um, history has become an interpretation in itself. And we think that uh, another person's view of history, if it's different from ours is, is flawed and wrong. Um, and so certainly none of us were alive more than a hundred years ago. So it's kind of hard to actually settle on what is true. What is the true history of any event? And unless we have some way of bringing the past into the present or proof, uh, it's very hard to do. And I think that's why the Holy spirit experience is so amazing because it brings power to the present. And it's the one thing that, um, makes us different always has is when we preach the gospel, we can tell people, try it for yourself. There's power here and it will back what we're saying up or it will back the Bible up. And there's no convincing on our part. It's just a presentation of the gospel. And so that's something that's very unique. It's something very rare. We in sort of relating to history, we can see that the Bible is historic. There are other, um, facts and things and, and history about what happened 2000 years ago, but, um, we can always have that proof with us. Um, 
Does anyone know? Hang on. Hey, you guys. Hang on. Okay. Um, does anyone know what the collective noun for historians is? I, I'm assuming not. You know what I mean by collective noun, right? Uh, what is it? A murder of crows and all that. Um, oh, by the way, a funny one. A funny one I found out recently was for um, buzzards or um, vultures. The, the collective noun for them is called a wake. Um, you know, because they're always around a dead body. So I thought that was funny. Um, but the collective noun for historians is an argumentation, an argumentation of historians. So even even that tells you a lot. Uh, a quote here, history is debate, history is discussion, history is a conversation. Uh, from a quote from 1957. Uh, history that is not controversial is dead history. So there's certainly people that embrace the idea that we can uh, discuss history and shape it to how we kind of see it. Um, a, a little bit of a another quote here. Uh, this guy wrote, historical claims to truth are aesthetic and ethical rather than empirical and objective. And um, he argued that historians make up stories and make no greater or lesser claims to the truth than poets or painters. So basically saying they're historians or artists, you know, they're no different to artists. They're, they're creating something. And um, the opposing view would say that history should be treated like a crime scene. It should be what are the facts, you know, what are the, um, what's the evidence? And that will tell you what the answer is, but that's very difficult to find. Um, so if you take a group of historians working on the same event, you're going to uh, get very different views, even if they're all intellectually honest, um, even if they're all highly critical, you're still gonna end up with different views. And um, they're all different people. They're all different from different walks of life. They all have different backgrounds, different contexts. And so that, that shapes the opinion. And I think that's what I get. Another thing that's great about the Holy Spirit is it, it's the great equalizer of us all. We, we've all seen people filled with the Holy Spirit from all different walks of life. And yet, in that moment, they have the same experience that we did and they understand the same things and they understand that God is true. And, um, we're, we're equal, you know, we're equal with spirit filled people. We have that same common experience in there. So the Holy spirit's this great, um, equalizer. It sees the diverse human race and it meets the challenge head on because the Holy spirit is the helper, the comforter, the converter. Um, and this is where I'm going to try and show a picture. This is just a, which we're on history. So I had to sit, show you this story I saw. Let's see if this works. Can it, can everyone see that picture? That's, uh, that's someone's effort at restoring a, uh, several hundred year old sculpture. Um, that's the original on the left and that's on the right, their effort. And I just thought it was funny because it sort of represents the, the, uh, recreation of history and, uh, you know, changing what really happened. That was the effort there. So anyway, so, uh, quite special whoever did that. Um, let's turn to first Kings chapter 22. First Kings 22.
And uh, this is the story of Micaiah. For some reason, I thought we'd gone through this recently, but I don't think we have. So apologies if we had. But um, verse 1 of 1 Kings 22. Now three years passed without war between Syria and Israel. Then it came to pass in the third year that Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, went down to visit the king of Israel, which was Ahab. Uh, and the king of Israel said to his servants, do you know that Ramoth in Gilead is ours? But we hesitate to take it out of the hand of the king of Syria. So he said to Jehoshaphat, will you go with me to fight at Ramoth Gilead? Jehoshaphat said to the king of Israel, I am as you are, my people as your people, my horses as your horses. Also, Jehoshaphat said to the king of Israel, please inquire for the, Lord, uh, for the word of the Lord today. Then the king of Israel gathered the prophets together, about 400 men, and said to them, Shall I go against Ramoth Gilead to fight, or shall I refrain? So they said, Go up, for the Lord will deliver it into the hand of the king. And Jehoshaphat said, Is there not still a prophet of the Lord here, that we may inquire of him? So the king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, There is still one man. Micaiah, the son of Imlah, by whom we may inquire of the Lord, but I hate him because he does not prophesy good concerning me, but evil. And Jehoshaphat said, let not the king say such things. Then the king of Israel called an officer and said, bring Micaiah, the son of Imlah, quickly. So he kind of doesn't like this guy Micaiah already because he doesn't suit his his uh, view of things, he doesn't like his messages because they're not what he wants. And um, some of the some of the dialogue in this story is actually quite comical. If you ever did a skit on it, you know, in verse eight there, Jehoshaphat said, you know, stop saying that, you know, um, don't don't speak like that. And uh, verse ten, the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah having put on their robes, sat each on his throne at a threshing floor at the entrance of the gate of Samaria, and all the prophets prophesied before them. Now Zedekiah, the son of Chenar, has uh, made horns of iron for himself, and he said, Thus says the Lord, With these you shall gore the Syrians until they are destroyed. And all the prophets prophesied so, saying, Go up to Ramoth Gilead and prosper. For the Lord will deliver it into the king's hand. So there's 400 prophets saying, yep, go forth. This is a good idea. Then verse 13, then the messenger who had gone to call Micaiah spoke to him saying, now listen, the words of the prophets with one accord encourage the king. Please let your word be like the word of one of them and speak encouragement. And Micaiah said, as the Lord lives, whatever the Lord says to me that I will speak. So even the, um, even the messenger was trying to shape the message here, um, suggesting that like, let's be, let's be positive, you know, uh, let's be encouraging. And uh, there are many points in this story where it just, it's just a clear example of how the truth is, um, is impacted today. But anyway, first, 15 then he came to the king and said to him micaiah shall we go to war against ramoth gilead or shall we refrain and he answered him go and prosper for the lord will deliver it to the hand of the king and that's another comical statement here because as we read he, that's not his message but he was just i mean if we could only see the scene i'm sure there would have been a, a lot of uh sarcasm slapped on as he said you know said the uh the message in the most positive way you know go and prosper for you'll win the battle but um it says in verse 16 so the king said to him how many times shall i make you swear that you tell me nothing but the truth in the name of the lord verse 17 then he said i saw all israel scattered on the mountains as sheep that have no shepherd and the lord said these have no master, let each return to his house in peace. And the king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, did I not tell you he would not prophesy good concerning me, but evil? 
So he's saying like, he had a bit of a laugh at the start. Then he told me the truth and the truth is disastrous. Then he turns to um, the other king and says, I told you, that's what he was going to do. Verse 19, then Micaiah said, therefore hear the word of the Lord. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne and all the host of heaven standing by on his right hand and on his left. And the Lord said, who will persuade Ahab to go up that he may fall at Ramoth Gilead? So one spoke in this manner and another spoke in that manner. Then a spirit came forward and stood before the Lord and said, I will persuade him. The Lord said to him, in what way? So he said, I will go out and be a lying spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. And the Lord said, you shall persuade him and also prevail. Go out and do so. Verse 23, therefore, look, the Lord has put a lying spirit in the mouth of all these prophets of yours. And the Lord has declared disaster against you. And so it's very important to remember that uh, this wasn't a situation where Ahab had no chance. Um, not at all. You know, he, uh, the Lord was predicting what would happen here, but um, uh, Ahab was presented the truth as well. And uh, that truth was being spoken to him. And verse, uh, well, skip verse 24, but someone was highly offended at Micaiah and went and slapped him on the cheek. Um, Verse 25, and Micaiah, Micaiah said, indeed, you shall see on that day when you go into an inner chamber to hide. And, and the king of Israel said, take Micaiah and return him to Ammon, the governor of the city, and to Joash, the king's son, and say, thus says the, the king, put this fellow in prison and feed him with bread of affliction and water of affliction until I come in peace. But Micaiah said, if you ever return in peace, the Lord has not spoken by me. And he said, take heed all you people. And uh, what ended up happening is that, uh, what, cause we won't read the rest, but what ended up happening was um, King Ahab, before they went into battle, swapped clothes with Jehoshaphat um, and disguised himself. Um, so obviously he knew there was, perhaps an element of truth there because he he uh kind of did this clothes swap and uh, said you know oh i'll be disguised just in case you know and and then uh, you can read about what happened but basically the the king actually died by being struck by a random arrow um a soldier just shot up an arrow into the air you know just random shot and it actually came between the armor of King Ahab and he died. And um, the story is, is I think interesting, not so much for the, for the end, uh, although that's what the Lord prophesied that he prophesied that, you know, you wouldn't, you wouldn't accept the truth and um, you know, your pride would, would be your, your downfall. But the, the journey there of, you know, this story having everything, um, it has that mass deception and then it has the one solitary truth and it's kind of like God's people. Um, there's a whole bunch of people, millions of people that call themselves God's people, but then there's the equivalent of one, you know, person, um, standing there, uh, speaking the truth. And you have in this story, the sort of the seeking for truth, but then, the abandonment of the seeking of truth and then the half heartedness of seeking for truth. So you can see all these things in the world today, you know, but people will go so far down the road to, to find what the truth is. And then they'll sort of walk off and take exit the path because oh, I've reached the point now where it's getting a little bit too uncomfortable and I like the message over there. So I'm just going to, I'm going to leave it here and, and move on. And, uh, you have, you have the out and out rejection of the truth because we know that King Ahab went to war and, um, and all these things. And so it's, it's a, it's an interesting story for, for, um, kind of that, that idea of mass deception and do you really want the truth? And that's what we're, we're preaching to people and it's difficult 
because uh, we're telling people things that they don't necessarily want to hear and they certainly may not have heard before. And most people, as it says, that you know, the narrow way uh, are going to put it aside. Um, in Ephesians, we won't turn there, but it says, put away lying. Uh, every man should speak truth to his neighbor. And the idea is there um, is that if every single person in their heart chose to spoke, speak the truth, we wouldn't have a problem today. But the fact is that um, that, that one sort of interaction with, with your neighbor results in the mass confusion that we have today. And it's sort of uh, great that the Bible sort of points that out and says, just simply speak truth with your neighbor. And the reason why we have this great breakdown of truth today is that there's so many weak links in the chain. There's so many people that uh, have given in and just don't care anymore. Um, and if every person spoke the truth, you know, what a different world we have. And probably uh, think back to the days of Adam and Eve and, and the truth and how that could have changed things as well. Um, I think that possibly something worse than just making up something that's not true is repeating someone else's lie because you don't care enough to investigate. Um, there's something, uh, I think the Lord despises about that. You know, um, there's the, these phrases that I'm about to mention are just common in the world, in the Christian world today, make Jesus your Lord and savior, whatever that means, by the way. I mean, it sounds like make Google Chrome, your default web browser, you know, but install this thing. Um, I don't even know what make, make him your default Lord and savior means, but, Give your heart to Jesus, say the sinner's prayer. All these things are repeated today without a second thought. Um, and people don't even, I don't know that they care. It's not in the Bible. Um, and I think that's uh, probably highly offensive to, to God, you know, to just repeat something you've heard and is good enough with you. Um, how are we going for time here? So. Um, yeah, I might just skip a few verses, but you can read in 2 Corinthians 11 about how it says even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. Um, so there is a great deception out there. But uh, let, let's turn to 1 John chapter 4. There is a way to overcome deception and sort of this mass mass deception that we see. And, um, in that story of King Ahab, it was a very obvious, uh, way to overcome that deception. He was presented with the truth and he chose not to believe it. And he had multiple opportunities to, to believe it and to test it and to keep testing it. And that's what we're going to talk about here in this, uh, one verse, first John chapter four, verse one. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. And so even when God's people uh, are tested with this deception or people in the world, there's, there's always a way out. And it's, and it's not a difficult way out, but most people uh, are too lazy or disinterested in, in the truth. And so most people will fail that test, but, but God's sheep, um, will test the spirits and will keep pressing and keep, uh, needling and keep earnestly seeking for the truth and they will find it. Remember in, um, in Matthew, it says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness for they shall be filled. Um, he wants people who are really serious, really hungering, really thirsting, really motivated, uh, for the truth. And that's why I, I believe in our fellowship, you know, we have a pretty on fire fellowship because while we're here, first of all, because we wanted to know the truth and we kept pressing into the Lord until we found it. And he delivered that power that I spoke about before. 
that same power that happened uh, on the day of Pentecost in, in Acts chapter one and Acts chapter two. Um, that's sort of a, the, the positive effect after, if that's how you find God, then your church is also going to be um, on fire for the Lord because it's a continual journey, isn't it? Um, let's finish on Judges chapter 16. Judges chapter 16. And verse 5. This is uh, one verse from the story of Samson and Delilah. So Judges 16, verse 5, it says, And the lords of the Philistines came up to her, Delilah, and said to her, Entice him, Samson, and find out where his great strength lies, and by what means we may overpower him. Uh, and so the reason why wanted to bring out this out is um, that note that the enemy wanted to know where the strength lied so that it could be overcome or manipulated or changed. And so the enemy comes after us uh, to our strengths and our weaknesses as well. But I think we perhaps may be more aware of our weaknesses and how they could be problem to us. So maybe in a sense, uh, we're stronger on the weaknesses, but um, we have to be careful on the strength as well and how our strengths can be the very thing that bring us down. And I'll give examples on that. You know, sometimes in the Lord, um, we can, you can have very bold people. You can have extremely bold people and eventually the boldness leads to arrogance and it leads to dominating everything. And suddenly you're thinking of yourself as greater than God. Um, so that's an example. Um, what about intelligence? You know, people that are smart, that perhaps people that know history really well, even, you know, people that know the Bible very well. Um, that sense, that, can, that is obviously a great thing to have, but when a strength becomes a problem is when, you know, that, that intelligence leads to a feeling of superiority. And, that, and I think many of us have talked to people like this that perhaps aren't around anymore that, no one else knows anything because I can recite the, the Bible, you know, backwards. Um, so we have to be careful, just like in this story with Samson, that um, it's not just our weaknesses that will be targeted. It's, it's our strengths. And, um, and I'll just finish on just wrapping up this thought about, you know, back to the current times and, and uh, the truth. Um, we know everyone has, in a sense, has to have their own truth now because there's no, I don't think there's anyone thinks there's a source of the truth out there anymore. And so everyone has to figure out where do they stand? Where do they stand in society? Which side are you on? Um, and it sounds terrible, but, you know, wh what is the common man supposed to do these days? You know, well, we know what they should do. Turn to God. Um, but in the world, you know, you just have no, sh no shot. You pretty much have to come up with what you agree with and, and call that your truth. Um, ironically, I don't think it's so different to how God wanted it because he, he always wants people to, as, as we said before, everyone, he wants to go and determine the truth and find out your right standing with God. Where do you stand with God? And if people are, like looking around and um, just seeing mass confusion. Um, God's okay with that because you, as long as you turn to him and don't accept one of those uh, versions of the truth out there, but you turn to God and find out and he'll give you the, the truth backed up with power. Um, and so you know, there's a term out there. I don't know if it's from a hymn or a, or a verse, but it's, it's about Jesus called as the rock of ages. And I envisage this rock, you know, Jesus, the rock that, you know, boulders and rocks will just last through centuries and, and be there. And he's our rock because he just, he just lasts through the ages. He stays consistent. 
um, and as everything around it becomes more confused and changes over time, um, he's, he's that one constant in our lives. So, and I'll leave it there. Amen. And I'll hand it back to Athens.